here at the Botanical Gardens at Victoria Park in Antigua and Barbuda. We're just steps away from the Department of Environment. I'm Patrice Martin. Welcome to the conservation series presented by the Department of Environment. Now all the weather conditions on the planet are very, very important to our climate. And these conditions are impacted by a number of activities, including our own actions as humans. Now on this program, we will look at how climate change impacts all aspects of our lives, livelihood, history, and culture. You don't want to miss this. Fearing the destruction from the next storm or hurricane, we abandon our home and businesses because they are in low-lying areas. Our fishermen's nets and pots go empty for days and weeks. The fish we need to feed ourselves are dying or left due to loss of habitat. Constant droughts have left our ponds and reservoirs dry, leading to water shortages threatening our health and our food supply. We've already begun to take steps so together we can make a difference and create a sustainable nation for future generations. Planting a tree, reducing your driving by using public transportation, carpooling or switching to an electric car, using energy efficient bulbs and appliances are all things you could do to make a difference in limiting climate change. Remember, there's no planet B. Welcome back. More hurricanes, frequent droughts, and increasing temperatures are signals that our climate is changing. Can we reverse it? Will we be forced to adapt to a new normal? And what exactly is happening in our corner of the world? Which marine ecosystems are facing threat from climate change in Antigua and Barbuda? A variety of them. So you have coral reef ecosystems, you have mangrove wetlands, seagrass beds, um, beaches, and limestone rocky shorelines. What are the major threats that climate change present to the marine ecosystem? One that's very dear to us is increased storm frequency and intensity. So strip more stronger storm, think about Hurricane Irma in 2017. Um, you also have sea level rise due to melting ice caps and the potential habitat displacement that that leads to. You have something called ocean acidification, which is caused by increased CO2 absorption in the water. And you also have coral bleaching, which is caused by raising sea temperatures. So what is coral bleaching? So corals are these very unique organisms. And so they're actually part plant, part animal. And as temperatures rise, that the plant part of the coral animal actually leaves it, which removes the color and it looks a kind of bleached appearance. And so that's what's called coral bleaching. And that actually affects their ability to produce food and survive in the environment. Has there been any sign of coral bleaching in Antigua and Barbuda's waters? We have seen some. Um, luckily, we've been saved by surprisingly storms. So storms tend to actually lower the temperature of the water. Um, we have seen some small cases of bleaching, but not any extended cases in the and Barbuda. Are there any positives to be gained in the fight against climate change? Seagrass beds and mangrove wetlands are actually a major carbon sink, and so they absorb quite a bit of the CO2 from the air. So by actually promoting the healthiness of these ecosystems, we actually supply ourselves better for the fight against climate change.
storms are part of our um, natural environment and they actually help to fragment the ecosystems in ways that help it to expand. But with the increased frequency of storms, you actually have fragmentation to the point that the ecosystems aren't able to recover between the storms. So when you have storms year after year, the ecosystems just continue to be degraded. And then when you add that in light with human pressure, you actually get a more degraded ecosystem than what was there before. As the seas absorb more CO2, it increases the acidity. Um, by very minute scales, but there are a lot of organisms in the sea that are limestone um, originated. So if you think about lobsters, conchs, if you think about islands like Barbuda, which are primarily coral based or limestone based, the increased acidity of the water actually results in greater degradation of these structures. So the lobster shells get weaker, so they're less able to survive. The conch shells get weaker, and you get more coastal erosion in areas like Barbuda. So that's one of the things that we're starting to look at how climate change is actually increasing ocean acidification and what effect that that has on us over time. The thing about climate change that we have to understand is happening in every single country in every single spot on the planet. For us here in Antigua, sea level rise is going to be one of the most unusual impacts. That's the one we have no answers for. So that would mean our beaches, our coastline, our hotels, which is our main uh, economic activity, is at the front line for destruction. You're going to see your beaches become narrower and narrower, and you won't notice it because um, those of us who are a little bit older remember the beaches being wider, and young people will just assume that that is the normal beach width. So you won't understand it unless somebody point it out to you and show you in videos. So that is really dangerous because it's like a creeping disaster. And that is one of the most insidious impact that we have to look out for. The big impact which we all know and we are familiar with would be hurricanes. But that is not the most dangerous one. And then of course we have drought. But we are accustomed in Antigua to prepare for hurricanes and to prepare for drought. We have no preparation strategy, for example, for sea level rise. So the impact of a hurricane and the impact of a drought is lessened because we're familiar and we know what to do. But for sea level rise, that impact, we need to sit down, we need to talk about it, and we need to design something around that. Or else our country will be very difficult to adapt in the future. Because once the, if we wait until the last meter of beach is gone, our coastline is gone, to put it back is going to be too expensive. And now we see a creeping impact of it's getting too hot to even be outside. Even sometimes you go swimming, the water is hot. Um, this is something we're always island breeze. We don't need too much air conditioning. That is rapidly changing. So how are we here in Antigua and Barbuda responding to climate change? We're actually developing projects to purchase electric vehicles. So in two years time, we should have another 500 electric vehicles in Antigua. And then we will have policies where if you're buying a vehicle, it will have to be an electric vehicle. We are training persons to maintain electric vehicles, to design them, to have them you know, install the chargers. So that's one thing that we're doing. We have a loan scheme that is gonna help low-income families purchase their own uh, renewable energy systems. The United Nations Framework on Climate Change is an intergovernmental body that sets international action across all countries. What the climate change um, convention says, okay, fine, I'll try and provide you with some resources. They're very small, very tiny, and they have a legal binding commitment to provide you with these resources. It's the only international agreement in the world that have this commitment. So we have to send our reports in every other year to the convention on what it is that we're doing and how we're going about doing it and what resources we need to help us to meet our goals. So in a big picture, this is what the department, our job is to, into, to negotiate agreements, to report on what we agreed to do. And our job also is to design projects and programs in Antigua that will make sure that we meet our commitment.
I think it's really important for not just uh, the hard sciences, the environmental sciences to be involved, but to remember that we're still humans. And yes, this is a human-made issue and a human-made problem, but the impacts are also being felt upon us as human beings. So it's always important to remember that when you're actually discussing and talking about climate change, because the impact is not in the abstract. It's not just going to destroy things, it's going to destroy lives and peoples and livelihoods. So in order to actually incorporate that, we have to look to the things like the social sciences and the humanities that are able to study people in their environments, able to understand the impacts on the people, whether it's economically, socially, culturally, right? If we're talking about um, climate refugees and people having to be, move away from their homes, how does that impact their lives, their livelihoods, but also the development and perpetuation of their culture and cultural attitudes. If you're no longer accessing specific resources that you have at your uh, disposal that you commonly exploit your whole lifestyle starts to change and so all of that of course impacts on how we view people and how we understand climate change within the lens of it's something that we are living with and living through for now and future generations climate change research through the social sciences and humanities so far has been primarily driven by things like archaeology and the study of the past. Um, so there's been a very active archaeological program that's being run through Antigua with, uh, in association with Dr. Murphy that has not looked at just the old pottery sherds and, and, and the jewelry and the daily lives of uh, Amerindian populations or historic populations, but has actually brought in specialists that look in what's known as paleoecology, which is the study of the ancient landscapes and the ancient ecologies that were here. And this includes things like deep sediment cores, so actually sticking a big core down through layers of sediment in um, salt ponds and marshes, and looking at things like uh, old pollen counts and the presence of seeds and small animals, and also looking at things that uh, in the archaeological record, such as the size of different types of shellfish or the size of different types of fishes available. As a matter of fact, we know that through human interaction, um, there's been at least 13 different identified species that have been hunted or driven to extinction throughout the history of Antigua and Barbuda, and that's only about 5,000 years. So if we take all of that into account, we can actually start to understand how the climate and how the environment has changed over time, and the human impact, and the human resilience model, so the way that humans were living in those past environments, were able to overcome some of these things. in collaboration with the University of South Florida and researchers there, looking at uh, soil stability on historic plantations and looking at that and the impacts it has on today's agriculture and agricultural businesses and looking at erosion and the different ways these landforms have shifted and changed with uh, the heavy sugar industry, then the abandonment of agriculture, now the return to agriculture in Antigua and Barbuda that all taxes the landscapes in different ways. And it's not necessarily the ways that we might think that the land heals itself after abandonment, but rather because of uh, the loss of, of um, input into these landscapes, the abandonment of the landscapes themselves has actually ended up leading to a lot of erosion and destruction of the landscapes themselves, which are now again being re-fostered now that um, people are engaging more agriculture again. So these past studies, the studies of what happened in the recent past and in the deep past, uh, are really important for actually understanding how to think about the future. Sea level rise uh, is of course going to be a very major impact here in the Caribbean, especially along the shorelines, especially for um, islands like Antigua that are relatively flat. A lot of the shoreline is within several meters of, um, of sea level. And that's not just the fact that the median, the mean sea level height is going to bring things underwater, but you also have to take into account storm surge and a variety of other events that'll happen that'll dramatically change how the coastline is and, and where infrastructure is located and all that. Thinking of Antigua as a tourism-driven economy and thinking of uh, the beautiful World Heritage Site in which we are right now, um, trying to think ahead 25 years, 30 years into the future and, and thinking about how we as a marina and as a dockyard where our are the edges of the historic dockyard are at water level. So in, in the past August, we had these big king tides and the water was lapping up over the quay already. 
which is an exception at the moment, but it'll become more and more regular over the next 25, 30 years with climate change and the um, sea level rise forecasts. So thinking of ways that we can actually start to mitigate that, protect these sites, um, has to happen now and has to start now, which we've already started doing here as well, and thinking about how we are going to protect these without destroying the outstanding universal value of the UNESCO World Heritage Site, because the last thing we want to do is destroy that. Um, and thinking about how we protect the main industries that happen uh, in Nelson's Dockyard, English Harbour, and Antigua, which at least in this end of the island in English Harbour, the yachting industry, the tourism industry, the hotel industry, and being able to protect these spaces where people come to have experiences and people come to spend time in. The Department of Environment is proud to announce that it has successfully presented Antigua and Barbuda's sixth national report to the Secretariat for the Convention on Biological Diversity. As a signatory to the Convention on Biological Diversity, Antigua and Barbuda is required to submit national reports on our progress in the implementation of the objectives within the Convention. The most recent report outlines our progress in meeting the set national biodiversity targets which are based on the Global Aichi targets. These are a set of 20 global targets under the Strategic Plan for Biodiversity 2011 to 2020. The sixth national report shows that we are making excellent headway in achieving these targets with 19 of 20 targets on track to be achieved by our set deadline. While we are pleased to have made great headway as detailed in the sixth national report, we will continue to improve our approach to biodiversity and commit to working with our stakeholders and the public to sustainably manage our biodiversity resources. The Department of Environment wishes to thank you for taking an interest in Antigua and Barbuda's progress and will continue to keep you informed. Remember, it is our responsibility to preserve our island's biodiversity today for the generations of tomorrow. Welcome back. I'm Patrice Martin, and we have been learning about climate change and how it is impacting our lives here in Antigua and Barbuda. Now, to shed even more light and to answer some of our audience's questions, uh, Dr. Christopher Waters, and he's the Assistant Manager of the Heritage Department at the National Parks Authority. We've got Makai Robertson, he's the Policy Officer within the Department of Environment. And Rulio Camacho, he's the Marine Ecologist also at the National Parks Authority. Gentlemen, welcome. Makai, we'll start with you. Now, how is Antigua and Barbuda participating in the global discussion on climate change? Right, um, so in relation to the global discussion, um, the forum is everywhere, as you could imagine. Uh, but particularly for the government who represents Antigua, um, we actually represent the people by going to what is called the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. So it's all it is, it's the International Climate Change Convention. And in that convention, you actually have negotiations that go on where we figure out and try to figure out what exactly, how we're going to respond to the threat of climate change. So Antigua's participation has been from the start of the convention, you know, even when they sort of negotiated the actual convention itself, uh, as well as going forward even to today, where we have a lot of the different um, representatives that are part of the delegation. They also uh, represent the country on thematic committees that deal with things like finance for supporting um, climate change action, as well as capacity building, which as, as you can imagine is extremely important to us as a developing country, uh, and things like that. So I think that is what I could say on our participation in the global discussion on climate change from the government's perspective. That is. I see we have a question from the audience. How does climate change affect protected areas and or managed areas? 
uh, climate change affects protected and managed areas around the world and here in Antigua as well. If you have to think about our coastline here on the island or in the, in, on the island's sea level rise is going to be a major impact of climate change. So anywhere that's close to the water, this includes countless Amerindian sites, but also some of our more famous historical sites such as the dockyard, but also think of town along the, uh, along the waterfront of town any kind of sea level rise that is then impacted or, or exacerbated by storm surge will cause a whole lot of flooding and damage in these areas. And so we have to start thinking very closely about how to protect those sites as well. Not to mention the fact that we also have to make, build resilience within our own communities, understand that we're here to protect the culture of Antigua and Barbuda, the contemporary culture, but also the historical one. And in order to ensure that, we have to go through educational processes, understand how these impacts are gonna affect our communities, our education systems and areas along, uh, within the island itself in order to ensure that um, Antigua and Barbuda can continue on as a nation, as a country, as a people for many generations to come. How does climate change affect the oceans? All right, so it's very important to remember and understand that the ocean is one of the driving force behind the Earth's climate. Right, so as the climate is shifting, it's going to affect changes in ocean patterns. So you can think of anything from sea level rise, which is primarily driven by melting ice caps. Um, you can think of changes in ocean currents and how that is affecting stuff that affects us locally, like hurricanes. So you've seen Hurricane Irma in 2017. On a more localized basis, you have things like um, warming sea temperatures, which is affecting our local coral reef ecosystems for a process called coral bleaching. Um, um, Chris mentioned earlier about our coastlines and, and how these are affected by sea level rise. But another thing that persons don't always um, appreciate is how that's also affected by what's called ocean acidification. So that's simply because of CO2 dissolving into the water. And areas like Barbuda, which is primary limestone, can get very affected by these processes. Um, so you have increased frequency of storms, ocean acidification, um, bleaching, and that not just only affects um, the us as humans and how we use it, but it also affects the distribution of species. Um, and even sea level rise, you have to think about certain species live within particular areas, and so the sea level rise, you actually have changes in these species distribution. But if they're not able to keep up because climate change is happening at such a rapid rate, they actually uh, may be extinct as a result of climate change. How is Antigua and Barbuda helping its population to adapt to climate change? Right. So from the government's perspective, um, we're approaching adapting to climate change um, from two approaches. So the first approach is planning for it, and the second approach is actually implementing those plans. So now when we're looking at the planning in relation to adapting to climate change, the government is undertaking what is called the National Adaptation Plan. And basically, in relation to this plan, the approach of planning looks from for about four key steps. So the first step is looking at how it's affected us in the past. This is very important to how we then strategize and look forward to actually implementing climate action for adapting to this threat to us. The next thing that we look at is projecting for the future. So that involves scientific-based modeling. Um, and it, it's geospatial, it deals with probabilities, it deals with all of these different things layered on top of one another so that we can have an overview and a mapping and an understanding of where exactly in Antigua and Barbuda we need to adapt to climate change. And particularly looking at it from, as well, a sectoral standpoint. So looking at it from the, the key sectors that we have in Antigua and Barbuda, like tourism, um, like yachting, managed areas, our natural resources that were all mentioned before when we were discussing all the other questions. And I think in relation to the next step that we are looking at, we are looking at actually planning based on all of that evidence that we collected in step one and step two. It's very important, and especially in the time that we are right now, um, to base all of our plans and our decision making on sound science. And I'm sitting next to two scientists, so and they can attest to the fact that sound science is how we make sure that we have sound decision making. And then after you have that sound decision making and planning, you have to now think of it from our perspectives as a developing country. 
So as a developing country, it is key for us to understand how we fund it because we have constraints that were from our colonial past that are now brought forward as a country we now need to figure out how exactly we tap into funding primarily as well not only from our problems of the past but our problems of the future as we have issues with um, a, a great amount of debt as a country because we want to develop and rightfully so the government engages in getting debt but that has an issue now with our fiscal space or how much money we're able to sort of adapt to and sort of use as the government to implement these different actions. So we go out and we look at international supporters and there are many different funds that are able to help us to get this money. But the only way that we do get this funding is if we have a sound scientific backing. And so everything comes into this holistic circle where you're looking at getting the scientific evidence, planning it, and then strategizing to, to get the funds in order for us to adapt to climate change. Well, there's so much to consider when you begin speaking about climate change, but that's where we will have to leave it for today. A very, very special thank you to our panel, Dr. Christopher Waters, Makai Robertson, and Rulio Camacho, and the Department of Environment, and to you, our audience. Now let's all do our part to ensure a much healthier planet for generations to come. Until next time, I'm Patrice Martin.